coming up on Theater Talk. There's a, a difference in your therapeutic styles, I think. Totally, that's uh, what I love. And I find, that, how does that take shape? How do you, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> it's good though, right? Yeah, 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 I like that. Describe the difference. You know? No, I was going <laughs> to ask you how you describe. I mean, I have my ideas, but I, but I'm not playing them. There are certain aspects to our current arrangement that are not acceptable, Marcy. I mean, although our net income per session is slightly higher with CCI than our previous situation, it has come at the cost of extremely time-consuming, redundant paperwork, telephone time on hold, telephone tag, requests for authorization, lost in the mail excuses, verbal authorizations that are given but not backed up in writing, along with authorizations for treatment that are rejected on the most petty grounds, so that our entire endeavor is beginning to... I'm sorry, to could you clarify what you mean by that? By what? Petty. Could I clarify it? The word you mean? Well, I know what the word means. I'd like you to clarify your precise use of it in regards to us. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and I am delighted to be joined by my guest co-host, Tony Award-winning playwright Warren Light. Warren, we are going to talk about a wonderful new play that is being presented by the new group, Good for Otto, which is written by playwright David Rabe, joining us, produced and directed by Scott Elliott, and it <laughs> features in a huge ensemble cast, Ed Harris and Amy Madigan, playing psychiatrists at the center of this whole world that you have created in this epic play, David. Tell us a little bit about what it is you've written. I live up in Lakeville, Connecticut, and there was a center there, and I did a fundraiser for it many, many years ago. And in the process, got to know the guy who ran it, uh, Richard O'Connor, and, um, and also I did a kind of dramatic version of some of the, some of the, it's like all the seats, not all the characters, but a number of the characters. And the title is the same, actually. And uh, so that's where it started. So it's a center uh, in, in uh, Berkshires where people come and go. There's not, it's not an inpatient place. It's not a, uh, any kind of asylum. They just come and go and in need for uh, care. And you have, as Ed plays, the guy who's, you run the center, your character. Well, I'm the chief the administrator. Chief, chief administrator. Yeah. And <laughs> the counselor. We're psychologists, I would say, not psychologists. Okay, it's my mistake. No but, problem. Yes. But uh, you, are, you, in your role, taking care of wounded people, are tormented. And this is, it would seem to me. <laughs> well, I have a bit of a problem with my dead mother. Yes, yeah. yes, who's, who's in it as well. How many actors are in this play? Fourteen. Fourteen, and one of them, spoiler alert, is your dead mother. But I thought, and this is why I reached out to Warren, I thought it was so interesting that you were dealing with the, the problems of being the caretaker for people with emotional, uh, emotional illness, and you wrote a whole television series in treatment well, about the problems of a caretaker of the emotionally ill. One, one of the things I was very impressed by in performance and in writing was you, a lot of us have been in therapy, a lot of us know people who need to be in therapy, but it's very hard to get into the head of the psychiatrist uh, uh, as a writer, because we, th that's, that person usually sits across from mm -hmm. you, and you don't know what that person is thinking or feeling by design, by the design of the process. And I thought you did, both of you, an exceptional, and actually you as well. I understood uh, the psychiatrist or the psychologist's point of view very clearly, and I assumed you had spent time talking to these guys and knowing how they work. Yeah, I, a little. I, I mean, I've not had my own experience, <laughs> but on the other side, yeah. of course. But, uh, the guy who ran the center, has, and, and Dick O'Connor is his name, had written a book. And in the book, uh, he spoke about his mother killing herself. Mm -hmm. And so, even though that wasn't part of the fundraiser when I did the thing, it was what always remained with me thinking when I would think about, uh, I'm going to make it into a full, or, or what I would call a, a real play and yeah. explore the whole dynamic. <laughs> that I knew I had a way into the inner life. Of, uh, there were also moments uh, where, where your character was, and this is always, when I started to do in treatment, I asked psychiatrists, 
how soon into therapy do you know what the deal is with the patient? And they will all say, pretty fast. And the struggle is how to get right. pa the, right. the patient right. to understand what the deal is. You, your character jumps to some uh, quick conclusions in, in the second act about a patient and how much of what, what this patient is saying is real and how much is fantasy. I like that depiction very much. And the need to build a bridge to the patient is important, but then to have that distance. And do very much so. There's a character, a young man, uh, that I deal with. I envy everybody who has someone in their lives. I, I see people on the street walking together, and I hate them. Is that weird? <laughs> do you feel that way ever? It doesn't matter how I feel, but how you feel, Alex. Yeah. Well, that's how I feel. <laughs> and then Ed and I actually talk about Dr. Michaels and myself, Evangeline, kind of commiserate, and I say, well, I think he's doing this, and Ed's character will say, well, it, do you think maybe this is going to happen? So you kind of get a little bit of how they're thinking and then you see me in the next therapy session with them. I love scenes between two, two therapists because they're... <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how you approach them? Well, that one, the one Amy just described, I, I um, again, I was, a, I was trying to develop a, a sense of their relationship sort of backstage, so to speak. And mm -hmm. I wanted to hit on uh, what, what I think is a an issue, the current kind of issue with psychiatrists is, is how much of yourself you bring to it, mm -hmm. uh, make available. Mm -hmm. You know, you always bring yourself, I assume, but, but how, do you, how much do you allow to actually experience and how much do you chase away? And so I wanted to work that in there. And then when I wrote the scenes with the patients, I always just tried to leave a space for them, and I give them great credit in Scott's work mm -hmm. with them, because I don't feel I did all that much from there and within the actual sessions, just other, other than allowing the correct space. And then the, in the end, there's a couple of scenes about their relationship. So Scott Elliott, you're the director. How was, what was Ed Harris taking space, uh, this process? Uh, well, I think that what David means is that maybe on the page, the char those characters are not as developed as the, pa the patients mm -hmm. who come to the center. There you get, I mean, you get a lot of Ed's background, you know, because his dead mother, as mm -hmm. we have revealed, is in the play. So that's there f to develop him. But Amy, her character is a mystery. Right, right. You know, you know, you you get to know her a bit in the end. Yeah. You know, in the very last scene, which I think is one of the most clever, clever things about the play, is that like yes. you, you have this woman in Amy's portrayal, like we talked, like Amy says very much about, you know, active listening and what does that really mean and, and how can you sort of, you know, how, how excited can an, a therapist get when a patient is having a breakthrough or, you know, how much a, a therapist has to withhold in order to get what they want. Um, but in the case of their, their dynamic, there's not that much stage time given to the two of them together. And I think that we've hit upon, well, of course, they're married, which is a lovely thing to have also because they already have wonderful chemistry. And we've done, you know, we've worked on three shows already together. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so their chemistry is, is always palpable from the stage. And I thought it would be fun to sort of exploit that in a way where they're not, they're playing coworkers and not people who are married, but people right. who are linked very deeply by the people they love. And by the intimacy of the work that therapists do. It's mentioned a couple of times in the play how remarkable what happens in a room with just two people can be. And, and uh, you, you made an, someone, I don't know who, makes an interesting choice of having the other patients and even members of the audience on stage. The whole time. The whole yeah. time witnessing these normally very private, intimate moments. Where does that come from? Was it, was it uh, Amy's idea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I came up with that, but that was something that appealed. The minute I read the play, um, I thought that, well, first of all, I, I was struck. It seemed to me like a, a very sort of contemporary and slightly demented our town. I actually think the fact that a lot of the actors in the play are known from other places, it gives people a little bit of a more in to them, it makes people a little bit more open to like the complexities of the play because it's a very complex play. There's, yes, we, we see back know, here you, the, uh, uh, many a known face. That's right. That's right. And people said to me, oh, and that person's in that? And that person? Yeah. Everybody's and I think in that, it, someone said. <laughs> well, I think that like that was a conscious decision because I thought that it would really make people sort of be able to sort of let other stuff go in order to be able to understand what the people are doing. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to make just 
regular everyday people part of the scenery because that's the scenery of the center. And so by combining it, I thought, I mean, I don't know, I get off on sort of watching the waiting room scenes and seeing all those people sitting there. And, sure. I, you know, for me, the imagery is potent. Is that easier or harder to have your whole cast around you rather than you're left to the stage and have the people on stage? Well, I, think I, I enjoy the fact that, first of all, most of my patients are there for most of the play, or our patients. Mm -hmm. And you feel that sense of, responsibility to them because they're there in a sense you know even if you're not dealing with anyone in particular so it's I like it I think it's good I mean the the fact that the audience is in the back you know is also there some of the audience yes is a little odd at times but it's I'm getting <laughs> used to it and I thought my idea was that they should also be mannequins you know just like fake people <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Easier to handle. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the play, though, when I watch it, is when everybody walks on at the same time. The audience and the actors sort of make the Oh, at the beginning? Yeah, no, I think yeah. it's no, at the very beginning. At the beginning, yeah. Like, you're like, what's yes. going on? Who's going? They're coming. Oh, wait a minute. There's so-and-so. No, I think you know, it's a great idea, and then I it's working. I love that part of it. Yeah. Yeah. One of your people is Rhea Perlman, who's, of course, known to everyone. And, and, and yet, I thought she was just a real person walking in mm -hmm. with the audience, because she's not in makeup, and, and, and that's... Uh, it's, it's an interesting combination of faces. And I did not notice F. Murray Abraham sitting back there, for, and he's in a bathrobe of all <laughs> Did I, you think someone was just in your robe? Really, I they didn't quite pick up on him. And then there's a wonderful actor who not, not, doesn't say a word until the second act. That's right. Molly he's Punchel, yeah. Fantastic. Now, David Rib, I wanted to ask you F. Murray Abraham plays a character who's 77 years old. And he's yes. expressing, <laughs> and I'm not yeah. outing where, your age. Where but, are we going? <laughs> <laughs> but uh -oh. he, he was expressing the issues of a man in his 70s, which I thought were very poignant and powerful. My wife screamed. She screamed about something awful, something hideous on the rug, which was, of course, the spilled drink. It's just a spilled drink, I said. What spilled drink, she wanted to know. It was a natural enough question, but it seemed unnecessary. What did it matter what spilled drink? Considering everything going on in the world at that moment, <laughs> what did it matter? I didn't answer. Do you as a playwright use certain characters as a sounding board for your own feeling? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he is one, along with Timothy. I feel a strong identification with Timothy. Well, that, that character is on the spectrum. You're not my friend. You're my therapist. And I want a girlfriend. I would say. Yes, Isn't that how we're going to put it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, yes. I think. And, yes. Uh, and also dealing with getting older. So this is a, a script that actors would very much want to do. But yet, I see you have all these people. I can't imagine the pay scale is ginormous. And, and How dare you, yeah. Susan? <laughs> you know, we've been around now, the new group, a little over 20 years, and um, we like the, our artists, and we always want people to come back and work with us. And, you know, we consider our, our group a little family. And, you know, whenever we're casting something, we always look at, you know, people that are in our family. And then when we don't have somebody to fulfill it, we look outward and expand our family. And in the case of this play, it's sort of half and half. Oh, it you know, is? Oh, yeah, I've worked with a lot of people in this play before. Yeah, and then some are brand new. But I've worked with these two. Yes, and, yes. Uh, F. Murray and uh, uh, Malik. Um, you know, a lot of the people. Laura Esterman, mm -hmm. Kenny Melman. Speaking of Kenny Melman, that's the piano player, uh, as, uh, among other things. Obviously, there's another Broadway play right now about music and depression, and I, I liked the use of music in this play enormously and found it, uh, I wondered how it got woven in and, and uh, what you've thought well, about I mean, music and depression and that sort of thing. Uh, it has something to do with my uh, mom's family and the way when I was kids they'd all get together and sing and, and uh, play all these instruments. And somewhere in the background, I know that's a big part of this, uh, where it came from. It also comes from that, um, again, Richard O'Connor, the, the, the guy that the, the wrote the book, um, he does have a group. They do go. They, he, doesn't, he said, I don't, if, when I wrote this, he said, I've never thought about my patients doing it. But he does have a group 
that he goes to and sings. And when I learned that, because I, I, I had the play, he didn't have the music, and I thought, this is tough, this play, okay. you know. Uh, and then I came up with that idea and integrated it. And then Scott is I into the concept of the play in these set pieces, but then Scott has taken it to a whole other level with Kenny and Kenny's gorgeous score kind of that he does. There's even a moment or two, I think, where, the, where several of the patients have rhythm instruments or do, yeah. it's, it, uh, that's well, all. That's all Scott taking the, the idea to another whole level. It's called being inspired by your work. That's but, what I did. I was inspired by it. And I, you know, I love the idea of just music as therapy and art as therapy. And I, um, you know, and Kenny, you know, he's Herb of Kiki and Herb. And yes, I worked yes. with them a few years ago. And I, you know, and I thought that Kenny would be a really great person to sort of have on the stage all the time and be in charge of all of that. He's your stage man. Sort of thing. In a way. Yes. Yeah. And in a way. And, and, um, and I thought that um, he, you know, his sort of warmth, because he brings a lot of warmth to the proceedings, would really sort of, you know, go another level to sort of warm the thing up. And, um, yeah, and I just decided to use music as part of the thing. And also, I don't know if you probably didn't notice, but, you know, theater geeks like me think about this, but there's nothing, there's no technical sounds. All the sound is just on the stage. Everybody's making the sounds. It's all music-based. There's very little, there's no sound effects in the, in the play. It's all organic and... Diegetic. In the thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, Ed Harris, my producer just reminded me that you played another Dead Mother play with Oedipus. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> you were in a casket, however. Oedipus <laughs> Rex. Did you, draw, yeah. did you draw any correlations there? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. All right. Well, what's lovely about this Dead Mother, she died when she was, we see her, she's a yeah, ghost she, that haunts she your. She committed suicide when I was nine. Nine, and so she's a young seemingly vital woman who is in, in some ways in the play trying to drag people to the dark side with her. Basically, yeah. Where does that come from? <laughs> Oops. I think that might be Big my one. answer. I just That's gave my another answer. hour. Yeah. Oh, All right. Everybody, uh, you know, yeah, everybody. you want to know every, everybody. I think everything. that's a common experience. All Not necessarily that, a mother, but the, do we? the dark side <laughs> we? is bringing our mothers. I'm, I'm kidding. My mother's still alive. And You're I, lucky. Do we? Yes, I am. So, all right, well. Mine was a little complicated. <laughs> <laughs> if the play has very much to do with mothers and things like that. Therapists, in some ways, are surrogate parents, right? They reparent you because things were missing growing up. And it, it, even though you're not drawn as a couple. I, I, did you, do you feel that you're a couple on stage or in it together in this little... In the well, I feel we're in, in the work together. I don't feel that as characters we're, you know, we don't really know each other that well, you know. Hmm. Um, and then we're both very private, yeah. solitary people, you know. We think with. we work. That's kind yeah, of right. like how these people are. Work molded. very hard. But they love this center and they love these patients. It's not like, well, that's, it's not like we yeah. socialize a lot. Yeah. Characters. Just, you know. just the one great scene. So I need to be alert but be patient. Be and not be. Be what he needs but not too much. <laughs> that's a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to white knuckle it myself. Well, there's an aspect of, of your place mm -hmm. we haven't brought up that it, Nancy Giles is the representative of the healthcare system, and you certainly are hitting a very mm -hmm. a profound point. Well, I'm certain I would find that helpful if it wouldn't be too much trouble. Oh, no, 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 not at all. Was that in the play from the start? Uh -huh. That scene was always there one way or another. I developed it a little bit when I did a play in Chicago, and then much again with a really, I think, significant and good addition uh, working with Ed and Scott on this. But it's basically the same. Basically the kind of linguistic trap and yes. kind of who's on first that they put you in. It frighteningly f reflects reality. Everybody mentions that scene. Yes. I think everybody, all of us, all, you know, everybody, all walks of life have the, the, that fear and that those feelings about the healthcare system here. <laughs> this is just to be clear, this is the idea that you may right. be in desperate need of help and you have eight sessions as a professional to, to bring somebody out of the worst crisis of their life and then the, uh, their health insurance covers no more of it. Is it? Yeah, I know if they want, you want to get them uh, hospitalized for, for a brief period of time because they're at risk to themselves, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can't, depending on whether the insurance company decides it's justified. Um, yeah. and, uh, and that's kind of the key event in this, right. and the other stuff is, you know, kind of part of what's the general background of the situation. Well, then, so then, as much as you care, 
you cannot buck the, that system. Well, the, yeah, I mean, the, the Riley McDonald, who plays the young girl who's having some serious problems, and her foster mother that Rhea Perlman's playing, I have quite a few scenes with them, and it's very frustrating, the, not just the scenes, but I mean, the, the actual events in the, in the story, there's no, you're powerless. I mean, whether it's protective services or the court system or, you know, the state restricting mental health funding. I mean, it's, it's been nine weeks since this, you know, thing has been established, but trying to get her away from her real mother and uh, adopted by this foster mother. And it's, and it's incredibly frustrating. Was it difficult to organize the, the, the scenes? Because you were dealing with how many different stories? There, I think there are 37 different Something like that. Little, little, you know, quote unquote scenes in the in right. two hours. Right. Well, once I found the order, the order stayed. Yeah. Because uh, I, I felt an organic connection and, and um, in the sequence that one scene, there was a way in which either theatrically the contrast of pace and rhythm of a scene or the subterranean elements would feed into the next one. Mm -hmm. And as we, uh, I remember saying to Scott, as we were approaching, uh, getting close to running through with lights and everything, uh, that you could start to feel that happening. And I mean, I, and I think it does happen. Had you written it pretty much act. in that order? Uh, I would, and... no, I, I, well, pretty much, yeah. yes. But, but I had a lot of shuffling at one point. And uh, uh, I did, when I, you know, I, I I took a very rough form of it. I did it in a little theater in Chicago, and I took a very rough form out there, and I did a lot of work there, uh, and a lot of scenes that didn't exist before that were written there. Um, so that was what I showed Scott, and what we then went to work with, what I ended up with. Not only do the individual sessions progress with different patients, but there's, a, I think, a thematic progression. Sort yeah. Of like a suicidality comes up right. with, with different patients. And the, the maternal, the necessity and the beauty of that mm -hmm. and, the, and the longing for that relationship. Mm -hmm. One of the great things I think that, that Scott managed to do was it's such a big play and there's so many characters and we had a good amount of rehearsal but a lot of that rehearsal was just how are we going to manage these 37 scenes and the transitions between them. So a lot of it was really, a lot of that rehearsal time was not as much as penetrating these characters in the scenes as it was trying to figure out how, in fact, this thing can work. You know, it was almost really, once we started actually being able to preview it and run it, that we started, Scott really started nailing, like, let's, you know, now it's time to f penetrate this thing. And that's still what's going on, which is interesting, because usually the first part of rehearsal, that's what you're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, but it, we kind of needed to, be able to have it be on stage to begin with before we could even think about like, mm -hmm. you know, who are these, what's really going on with these people, yeah. you know? Right, isn't it? It is true, my, you know, it was mm -hmm. one of those things where your, my brain had to work like that in order to sort of figure out, you know, how to make it happen. I mean, I knew that we would be able to fill in the blanks. I knew that that's something that I, I knew, I know how to do pretty well. And, uh, but I was, the beastness of the whole yeah. thing was, uh, daunting, but exciting daunting, you right. know, like, uh, I mean, it's something that you, for me, it was like having a, you know, a big Sunday, you know, it was delicious. And it was really fun to, you know, work yeah, with all Yeah, just even running it, it when we were still in the rehearsal room and we were going yeah. to leave the rehearsal room, uh, which everyone was like, we're ready, everybody, but everybody, let's not. Yeah. And it was like, okay, we're going to run through the play. And even just in the room, everyone was kind of like, okay. Yeah. We're going to do it. Yeah. it. You know, it was a it's very exciting. exhilarating participatory yeah. Process, and I think everybody you know? kept thinking when I was going to start kicking, kicking their asses, and then I started <laughs> doing that once we had, you know, the the show up. There's a, a difference in your therapeutic styles, I think. Totally, that's uh, what I love. And I find, that, how does that take shape? How do you, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> it's good though, right? Yeah, 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 I like that. Describe the difference. No, I was going <laughs> to ask you how you. Just, I mean, I have my ideas, but I, but I'm not playing them. How do you think you approach your patients differently? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. Well, you know, I tell you just personally, we're different people and just the way we approach our work, the way we rehearse, the way we do our research, the way we prep. I mean, there's just different ways you you approach things and you come into it. So I think that kind of helped us out. And I, within the play, you get to see me with my different patients a number of times and 
hopefully there's a progression with some of them and not everybody comes out great on the other side of it. So, um, and I, I really love listening in this play. I just absolutely have embraced it and cherish it. And I thank you both for that. It's good for Otto at the Pershing Square Signature Theater, a new group production. Thank you, Ed Harris, Amy Madigan, David Rabe, and Scott Elliott for being here at Theater Talk. And thank you, Warren Light. It is always a pleasure to have you here. Well, to be with these guys and yes. with you is great. Yes. Do I have a circle? Somebody said it's friends. Is, is that right? Well, yes, yes, in a way. Okay. What way? Because I want friends, not just the guys at the house, but friends everywhere, because then I can have some for old time's sake someday. You're not my friend. You're my therapist. And I want a girlfriend, because I want to get married. I, I don't think I will have children, though. My mom and dad like my brother's kids, but they are rude and messy. <laughs> so no kids for me. That's what I think. What do you think? Is that what you've decided? After due consideration, that is what I decided. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bow Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.